Merrily, to start, can you say something about the subject of the book and why you wrote it? Well, I've always uh, been, all of my work has uh, really been on or related to sort of intellectual history in the 16th century and its relation to literary texts. And I've always been interested in how people in the period thought about and talked about reading, writing, and thinking. Um, so that's something that all of my books have in common. And uh, I got, I wrote my second book, uh, used sort of uh, cognitive uh, psychology and linguistics to look at Shakespeare's use of language. And in the course of working on that, I got interested in literature and science in the period. And in, there's been sort of interest, a sort of new interest in like over the last 10 years maybe in looking again at science and the scientific revolution and its relation to literature. Um, and people were trying to show that Shakespeare in particular um, was aware of new ideas in science, so Copernican you know, theory or things like that. And a real desire to see Shakespeare on the side of the new. And I, that, was, it didn't, that didn't seem to be correct to me. Um, and then going back to graduate school, there's this sort of, I, I talk about this in the book, there's kind of a received narrative about um, what people in the 16th century thought and how that changed in the 17th century. And it's really based on claims made by people in the 17th century who were advocating sort of a new approach to natural philosophy. So they really denigrate the 16th century and they say they didn't look at nature, they only b believed everything they read in books and they believed all this superstitious stuff and then lo and behold, the 17th century, and the scales fell from everyone's eyes, and they decided to look at nature, and they, and it was much more complicated than that. So I got interested in just looking at what people knew in the 16th century, and how aware, how aware were they of all these sort of, this sort of intellectual ferment of new ideas, and how did they feel about it, and then how is it reflected in literature? Um, so, and then I was at a, a conference in Germany and uh, I kind of came across the idea that Arist the sort of Aristotelian consensus that was the kind of shaped people's ideas about the, the nature of the universe before the 17th century has a lot in common with what cognitive psychologists call intuitive science and that's sort of the the, the way even children or, you know, just your ordinary experience of the world, ideas about it that you develop. Um, and th it seemed to me, and, and that, that science educators have realized that that's really intractable. And people can take college physics at Harvard, and at the end of the class, they still hold sort of incorrect intuitive ideas about force and motion. Um, and so what happened in this period was a divergence of intuitive science from official science. And I thought, that must have been upsetting <laughs> to live through. So I went back thinking, okay, this is a way to revise that narrative that I haven't been happy with. And so I looked for signs of that, and fortunately, I found them. I think that you've already partly answered this. You write that your book is a cognitive history. What do you mean by that? Bec partly um, in the sense that I'm not just interested in what people knew or what they thought. I'm also interested in how they thought it. And I'm especially interested in um, and, and how they felt about what they knew and thought. Um, and, you know, recent cognitive psychology has emphasized that rational thought can't be separated from feeling and emotion. Um, so it's an attempt, you know, as far as is possible to go back and try and get a sense of, you know, what did they know? What did they think about how they knew it? And how did they feel about that? Um, and to look cl closely at imagery, actually how people, even in scientific treatises, how do they talk about what they know and what they don't know. Many have written about how modern scientific thought emerged from pre-modern irrationality and superstition. 
However, there's somewhat less scholarship on how this evolution was manifested in literature. How innovative is your book? Well, for one thing, I'm really arguing that many of the ideas that people held in the 16th century that have been viewed as irrational actually were quite rational, if you understand where they're coming from. Um, and there are historians of science who've also argued that, but literary scholars have tended not to be. They, literary scholars have tended still to rely on the sort of Francis Yates and it, they, it was, you know, the supernatural and, um, and whereas actually a lot of things that on the surface to us seem irrational um, make perfect sense if you understand the sort of system. Um, so that's a new thing for literary scholars. And then the second thing is I, I really read a lot of uh, a focus, and, and this makes perfect sense, um, historians of science tend to focus on cutting edge work, like people who are advancing knowledge. I actually read a lot of popularizing treatises written throughout the 16th century, because I'm really interested in what did ordinary educated people know. And so um, I think my book has a more sort of, there was just a long period when people started to understand that the ideas that they always held about the universe um, weren't necessarily true anymore, and a long period of confusion, and sort of interesting and fertile confusion. So I'm arguing that literary texts at the end of the century reflect that sort of anxiety and confusion. So the, the question isn't, were they getting it right? Did they understand the new ideas? A question is, what were they thinking, and how did they feel about it? You write about, and I quote, the mingled elation and horror that authors such as Marlowe, Spencer, Shakespeare were living through at this period. Can you say something about this elation and horror? Well, different writers feel, so for instance, Spencer, Edmund Spencer, who I write about, um, was, uh, so one of the new ideas that was really disturbing people at, toward the end of the 16th century was, is, was very important in the Aristotelian system that above the moon nothing be able to change. And um, there was a, and that belief in that sort of stability and permanence of that sort of high, higher level of the universe kind of stabilized everything else. And there was a supernova in 1572 that sort of demonstrated to people for the first time that change could occur in that area. And that was really upsetting to people. And in The Fairy Queen, Spencer really takes on this issue of change. Um, like how pervasive is change in the universe. And he tries it once and um, has sort of characters who say, there is this change, it's this really dangerous thing. And then another character comes in and says, no, that's not true, nothing is changing, it's all under control. Uh, and then he's unable to be satisfied with that. And then he writes another book and he takes it on again. Um, so he doesn't feel much elation. He really is just trying to um, come to terms with this idea, and I think he keeps trying to argue it down, and then it won't go away. It comes back again. Um, Sh Shakespeare, on the other hand, is really seems, on the one hand, interested in um, uh, possibility for, of... Um, abstraction and control over nature and you know some possibilities that this these new ideas could be beneficial but on the other hand um, in King Lear especially um, new ideas about nothingness and about uh, a sort of at atomic theory of matter that saw the universe as made up of tiny little particles with void space in between so that nothingness is part of the very fabric of the universe and in King Lear is not an optimistic play, and I think that a sense that the kind of rug has been pulled out from under the fabric of the universe is part of the sort of um, what that play is struggling with. Um, what, you, what you see, um, the surface of the world, isn't telling you the truth about what's really true, and what's really true is sort of this kind of nothingness. What type of sources, texts, did you use in your research and how did you go about locating them? 
Well, this is, I can thank the library for this because Boston College was really a, a very early in terms of universities in um, giving faculty access to early English books online. Um, and EBO, we, we call it, um, uh, offers PDFs of every single book published in England from the invention of printing until beyond my period, into the 17th century. So any book published in England in this period, I can just go on my computer and download a PDF of it and read it. Um, and you know, at the beginning of my career, to look at those books, you had to go down in the basement and look through microfilms. And it was a very slow process. So you couldn't read through 20 treatises to find people talking about the things that you you know, need to need to find. So Ebo was great because I could, you know, reading and say I'm trying to think. Okay, if I want to know if people in the 16th century worried about this gap between their, you know, experience of the world and new theories about it, and I just had to read a whole bunch of stuff published in the period, and um, Ebo made it possible to do that. So um, you you kind of have to. Um, do enough research to know what you're looking for, and then read through those texts, and you start finding it, and then that refines what you're looking for, uh, and then you can go back and read more of those texts. So, You write, and I quote, this book may be modestly useful in calling attention to the problems we face today because science is so counterintuitive, end of quotes. Would you like to elaborate? I mean, this partly builds on, again, the work that's been done by um, uh, cognitive psychologists and specialists in science education on the difficulty of teaching counterintuitive concepts, especially in physics, and just how intractable intuitive ideas are. And, um, you know, the scientific revolution of the 17th century was the moment when official science diverged from intuitive science, kind of, sort of for the first time. And, but science since then has basically become progressively counterintuitive. Um, so a lot of things that um, are accepted as true by scientists um, that people doubt are things that they can't observe directly or that don't seem intuitive. So. Um, I think there's a tendency to sort of think that people who don't ac accept that climate change is caused by people or people who doubt evolution, um, that this is a sort of irrational response. In fact, it, it's, it's not. Um, and so, I mean, it doesn't mean that it's correct. It just means that it's understandable and th that possibly we should think in different ways about, you know, when you're trying to explain ideas like that, you have to understand that you can't observe millions of years, uh, you know, so if this, if it's something that people can't see or experience, then it can be difficult to sort of trust the argument. What do you hope readers will take away from the book? Well, I hope that people will Stop insulting 16th century thinkers. I mean, that, that people can see that um, beliefs about the natural world in the 16th century were confused and wrong, but not, for, not because people were irrational, not because people weren't thinking hard about these issues. And this sort of, again, period of sort of searching and confusion um, was really interesting and it informed literary works. Um, so I hope that when people are trying to think about the impact of science on literature in this period, that they don't just look for people getting it right, that you have to look for whatever it is that's there. Um, so, uh, and I hope actually some of the really obscure treatises that I ended up reading um, are actually really interesting. Um, there's a guy named Robert Record who wrote treatises on arithmetic, algebra, um, astronomy, and the examination of urine. 
And so he was kind of a polymath. But, and these are all written in, uh, well, most of them are written in dialogue form. And they're actually sort of interesting works. So I hope more people will read some of these things that I dug up out of Ebo. Meredith, what's your next project? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I've uh, been interested just because of the Institute for the Liberal Arts and working on the core in liberal education and the sort of the history of it and um, possibly an idea that some of the, um, the kind of crisis of liberal education that people talk about today um, is really a sort of repetition of a, a crisis that's happened many times uh, over history, you know, a sort of fight about whether education should be pragmatic or what should it be doing and the relationship between education and social class. So my first book was on, actually was on education in the 16th century. So I've started doing some reading for maybe to think about a broader book on liberal education, but I'm in really early stages.